My name is Sheila Thomas and I'm with the San Diego History Center and I want to welcome everybody to the 2020 uh, version of Fashion Redux. So normally we would be doing this having a finale party at the San Diego History Center, but as everybody's aware, the San Diego History Center is um, closed at the moment. So we have adapted and found a way to provide a program to celebrate the students, their designs, and to also celebrate the um, history of fashion as well by providing a virtual program for you all. Um, for those of you that are new to the History Center, um, we are a nonprofit organization that has been around for 92 years. We have two locations. Our first location is in Balboa Park. That's our main museum. Um, we are also, we also have a second location and that is the Junipero Serra Museum in Presidio Park. Um, where we just commemorated the 250th anniversary of San Diego and is that's also the home of the site of the founding site of um, the state of California. Um, so our mission at the San Diego History Center is to preserve, promote, and reveal the history of San Diego in our region. And uh, we can't do that without all of your support. So I would like to thank all of our members, our donors, and any supporters, the visitors from around the world that we get um, annually. And um, without your support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And for those of you who are not members of the History Center, um, I invite you to join as a member and to help us continue um, with our mission and continue the work that we've been doing for the past 92 years. So right now I'm going to um, give you a quick overview of the Fashion Redux uh, website. So just bear with me here. The Fashion Redux website can be found at, um, on our website, which is sandiegohistory.org. And if you go to the exhibitions tab, um, you're going to click on here. I'm just going to do a share screen for those of you who want to see here. Does everybody see my screen? No? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Remember that technical difficulty here that we've been talking about? Give me just a moment. Here we go. So this is our Fashion Redux website. And when you go here to the exhibitions, the drop down, you go to current exhibitions and you'll click on Fashion Redux. This is the top of the page. These are the um, four designer gowns that we are featuring in tonight's program and as part of the exhibition. They were chosen as the top four student designs um, of Mesa College. Scrolling down here, you'll be able to see the four inspiration pieces from our own collection at the San Diego History Center. Um, it, it lives in the archives and um, you will be able to click on each piece and read about all of these designs. Scroll down a little bit further, you'll find the student garments and clicking on each of those student garment pieces, you'll be able to find out a little bit more about each of those pieces and the inspiration behind each one of those uh, student designs. And then here at the bottom, we've added additional content here for you to be able to look back at the past exhibitions that we've done with Mesa College for Fashion Redux since this is our ninth year um, doing this uh, program. So uh, what we're going to do now is, um, before I introduce our collection specialist, I would like to turn everyone's attention over to uh, the polling tab on your site. We are going to be taking a live poll to um, vote for the People's Choice Award. So um, throughout this presentation, you can vote at any time. And then once we are done with the panel discussion with the students, we will be um, announcing the winners of the People's Choice Awards and then the additional categories um, for this year. 
So without any further ado, I would like to introduce Leilani Alantaga Caithness. She's our collection specialist at the San Diego History Center. Thank you, Sheila, for the introduction. Um, I first want to congratulate the students on such beautiful presentations um, and for and to Jordan really for facilitating the entire event with Sheila. And I know this is kind of a strange way to present um, an exhibition, but I think it's really exciting that we were able to pull it off virtually. So what I'll do is talk a little bit about the uh, historic clothing collection in general and um, provide some highlights from the collection and then and the history behind them um, and sort of how those specific highlights um, informed and inspired later decades, I mean, hundreds of years later. So um, in the historic clothing collection, we have 6,000 objects and they illustrate 250 years of fashion and design history. So there are women's, men's, children's, American, European, and Mexican garments. And um, I was telling Sheila and Jordan in an earlier discussion that we have at least one example for every decade in that time span. So um, it's not necessarily encyclopedic, but um, it's vast. and. Um, it's really quite special. So all of the objects in our collection were either owned by somebody from San Diego or worn by somebody from San Diego. So there is a very clear connection um, with every single 6,000, every single one of the 6,000 garments. Um, I want to talk a little bit about one of our gems in the historic clothing collection, which is our bloomer ensemble. Um, it really represents a pinnacle moment in feminist history, which um, informed fashion in the 70s too. Although indirectly, it's, there was still an influence and I will show you an image uh, just now. Um, can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so the Bloomer Ensemble um, came to us from the descendants of Anna uh, Lee Gunn Marston, who was the wife of George Marston, and he was essentially the founder of the San Diego History Center. Um, they were made around 1850 and they were originally a dress, which we think was made in 1849. So um, women at the time, uh, struggled with uh, living their everyday lives with such restrictive clothing, such as Victorian dresses. So feminists during that first wave of feminism during the second half of the 19th century launched the dress reform movement. And really it was a response to um, kind of the emotional and physical toll that dresses took on women during the period. And one woman in particular, a writer named Amelia Bloomer, um, published an article in a journal indicating or providing very explicit instructions on how to create bloomers out of your dresses. Um, funnily enough, the dress reform movement was a spectacular failure. It didn't catch on. Um, it kind of just disappeared into history. Although, um, you know, now there are a lot of scholars looking at that period and kind of drawing the connection between how they really set the, the stage for how women began to take more agency over their bodies and um, what exactly they wanted to put on them and how they made them feel. So um, although, uh, you know, it was a failure, like I said, um, these bloomers are actually the only existing example um, of bloomers in the world. So the San Diego History Center really feels special to have these and they have been exhibit, exhibited um, in major exhibitions in the US, most recently at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation and then prior to that at the Met in an exhibition called um, Men in Skirts. So um, what was I gonna say, sorry. Um, I'm just really excited to talk a little bit about our collection and uh, Jordan will talk a lot more about the period um, and sort of the cultural climate then. Thank you, Leilani, very much. That was great. Um, it's always wonderful to be able to see what we have in our own collection and share that with the world Absolutely. since um, we don't get that opportunity all that often to do that. So thank you for presenting that. Um, now I would like to uh, introduce Professor Jordan Smiley, a fashion professor at Mesa College. 
Thank you, Sheila. Um, I'd like to thank Sheila and Leilani and the San Diego History Center for allowing us to have this collaboration. This is quite a feat that we do. Um, I believe this is our ninth year doing this. And basically, just for those of you who aren't as familiar with what uh, this whole exhibit is about. What happens is together with the History Center, we usually pick a decade or a theme, and that's kind of our focus. And then the History Center pulls garments that fall within that decade. And then the students are invited to come down and they take a look at those garments up close and in person. And the opportunity they get is amazing because they sketch, they look up close, they take photographs, they ask the collection specialist questions about the garments. So they really get an eye-opening view of that time period in particular. Uh, after that, the students go back home and they do a little more research on their own about the period. And using what they've seen in the museum, they then uh, come up with a design that um, basically is inspired by those garments, but it's a reinvention of those garments in their own way that uh, deals with their own personal design aesthetics and makes it a little more modern as well. Um, then um, this happens with everyone in the class and it's actually open to any of our fashion students as well. You don't have to be in the draping class. It just happens to be the project. And then at the end of the semester, uh, all the students who have participated put their final garments up on mannequins and we invite fashion industry professionals to come in and we all take a look and they're all uh, voted on. And the top four designers are the ones that get to go on and have their designs presented in the museum. So uh, I think the designs, you guys dropped your garments off and like the next day was when we had to go virtual online, no more in-person stuff. So it was heartbreaking to say the least, but I know that we're all very, very thrilled to have this opportunity. So thank you for making this uh, digital version possible. Now, uh, before I introduce the designers to you, I'm going to talk a little bit about the period because as I said, every year we pick a decade and this year, the decade was the 1970s. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on the fashion at that time. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. So the 70s was very radical, both in fashion changes and in political climate and activism. There was a huge rush of environmentalism and there was also a very steadily growing feminist movement that was happening at the time. There was a huge increase focus on individuality, which led to an emergence of subcultures and style tribes. And all of this had a huge impact on the development of the fashion trends at the time. The feminist movement was large. And although it started in the 60s, it really kind of ramped up and increased in the 70s. Um, this was due to a lot of factors, but one of the big ones was that um, at that point, about more than half of the American women were working outside of the home. So this led to an increased demand for workplace apparel, such as pantsuits and business attire. Um, they had feminized versions of men's business suits as well. It also led to a change in the shopping patterns. Women really wanted those transitional looks that could go from day to night very easily and that could last very comfortably. So uh, designer, Diane von Furstenberg came out with these wrap dresses. They were enormously popular. It also led to a more fluid silhouette, an easier, more casual fit, not as restrictive. As I said, another influential factor was the environmental awareness. Uh, we celebrated the first Earth Day in 1974. We created the Environmental Protection Agency, which led to the Endangered Species Act. And because of all this awareness, there was a huge increase in the manufacturing of fake furs. Buying real fur was looked down upon, so fake fur really started booming. These subcultures and style tribes. So this was a huge trend in the 70s, was using fashion as a way to express yourself. You could deviate from society's norms. These style tribes emerged, which were basically groups that wanted to diverge themselves from the mainstream. They were hippies, glams, mods, punks, etc. There was a lot of different groups. Um, some of the more common ones that you've probably heard, so hippies, for instance, um, they really emphasized environmental awareness, social acceptance. They translated their um, beliefs into the popularity of natural fibers and earth tones. This also led to denim being a huge increase in popularity. It was also seen as a way for um, self-expression. People began embroidering designs on their denim, adding patches, painting messages. This in turn led to the arts and crafts movement, 
uh, which really placed a high value on handmade and hand altered items, which led to the wearable art that people often saw, such as crocheted pieces, knitted pieces, felted pieces, dyeing, painting on the cloth. Another subculture was the glams, and these were heavily influenced by the glam rock. So music became really prevalent at this time and really pushed the development of um, these kind of small subculture groups of fashion as well. Another big fashion trend was non-Western influences. Travel was much more widespread and convenient for all. And because of the exposure to different areas in the world, design inspiration started to come from a bunch of different cultures. Uh, designer Yves Saint Laurent was important in that he helped introduce elements such as folkloric embroidery, African beading. He used these in couture. And batik prints were definitely on the rise, as you can see in a bunch of the hippie movement as well. And just a summary, some major fashion trends. Uh, there were a bunch of unisex styles. Trousers, blue jeans were huge. Corduroy, polyester, double knit, almost everything you bought was made out of those funky fabrics. Uh, peasant blouses. As you can see, the fit was usually tight on the top and looser on the bottom. Skirts, oh my goodness, there was mini, there was midi, there was maxi, there were a million lengths. Midi wasn't quite as successful, but from the very, very short to the very, very long, you had everything you could want. Wide lapels, collars, and ties, and let's not forget about leisure suits. Those were some of the best. And definitely those patchwork, as you can see in that bottom photograph there, they had patchwork prints bright, bold graphics, um, using complementary and conflicting patterns together, that was all huge. And last but not least, just some designers that were popular at the time. So Yves Saint Laurent, as I've mentioned, Diane von Furstenberg, Halston, Kenzo Takata, Carl Lagerfeld, Vivian Westwood, and Zandra Rhodes. There were a bunch more, but these were some of the biggies. So now that we've gotten kind of a view on what the fashion was like in the 70s, I'd like to introduce our panelists and they're gonna tell you a little bit about themselves. So let's start with Evelyn. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, um, my name is Evelyn Zuniga. Um, I'm honored to be part of the Fashion Redo uh, 2020 um, Top Four. <laughs> um, I was born and raised um, in San Diego, California. I'm Mexican American. And I feel like my cultural background definitely influences the bold colors I go with when I design any of my stuff. Like you mentioned, Jordan, like the folkloric embroidery and like most of like Mexican and indigenous culture is a lot of very bright colors. Like the vest I'm wearing, I got in Mexico City. <laughs> and I feel like, yeah, my culture definitely influences the way I design and everything. My biggest inspiration is my mom. She's amazing and I love her with all my heart. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Evelyn. That was lovely. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Hello. Uh, I'm Maureen Weiss. I'm French from Paris and uh, this is my second year studying fashion design at Mesa College and I love it. Um, I've always been, uh, I always love all sorts of crafts so, arts and fine arts and everything that involved creation. So uh, what led me to fashion design is probably I wanted to reach out to the little girl that was uh, inside of me and I didn't allow to come out in France. I never allowed myself to dream about being a fashion designer. So uh, America um, helped me to have this dream. So I'm very honored to be a part of this uh, adventure and that's it. <laughs> Thank you. We're glad to have you. Um, and next, I'd like to introduce Orancia. Hi, I'm Orancia. I like to say I was raised in Tijuana and I grew up in San Diego since I've lived half and half. Um, I actually have a science background. I studied kinesiology at San Diego State. Um, but I am studying fashion because I hope to make functional clothing for everyone. And it's, it's a fun challenge to combine two different fields. I find design to be as equally challenging as science is, just a different part of your brain. And I'm very happy to be here as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And last but certainly, certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Geneva. Hi, my name is Geneva. I'm Mexican American and I'm a second year design student at Mesa College. 
And I'm so excited to have been chosen to be in the top four. Um, I also studied at San Diego State. I graduated with a degree in economics and my heart always told me that I needed to be a fashion designer. So I went back to school and I pursued my dreams of becoming a fashion designer and I'm having the best time doing it. That's lovely. We love having you too. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to start uh, by asking the designers some questions. And after that, we can open it up to you guys, our um, viewers, and see if you guys have any questions as well. Jordan, I just wanted to add to remind everybody, now that you've seen all the dresses that the designers just presented, um, to find that polling button, answer the poll, and vote for your favorite design for the People's Choice Award. Perfect. Thank you, Sheila. All right, Geneva, I'm going to start with you. Um, a major theme in the 70s fashion was individuality, allowing people to express themselves through personal fashion. Can you please elaborate a little bit on what your personal design aesthetic is and how you translated that into your garment? So my personal design aesthetic is a very feminine aesthetic and I like to empower women of all sizes. So I consider myself a size inclusive designer because it's very important to me to include everyone regardless of their size because it's not, to me, it's not important what the size is. It's what is important is your style and being able to express your style. So um, the, I definitely took into account that the 70s was very heavily influenced by um, like a very crafty and so, I wanted to combine different elements to make something unique and something that would definitely express individuality. So I chose to combine a very floral, bright chiffon and, um, and lace insets. So I think that it made for a very unique design. It truly did. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Next question goes to Arancia. Uh, I know that you were influenced by the women's rights movements of the 1970s. In particular, you had a strong affiliation with uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Can you talk a little bit about how that particular movement inspired your design? Sure, of course. So as you mentioned, I come from a science background, so it's quite difficult for me to find that creative inspiration. Some people find it through color or fabric. I find it through research. So I did research in the era and I, known of RBG and I've loved her work since the time back but knowing during the 70s she was such a prominent member and a woman's voice I thought it was amazing so I definitely wanted to um, show her off and her statement necklaces in particular tend to be a big part of her um, of her persona in the courthouse so that French that I included in the pants are like a, a statement to um, honor Justice RBG. That's wonderful. Fabulous job. Um, I'd like to go to Maureen next. Maureen, in the 70s, there was a rising interest for ethnic textiles due to the increase in convenient travel. Can you talk about what you discovered in your research regarding the ethnic textiles of the 70s and how this inspired your final design? Uh, I think you express it very well in your presentation <laughs> first. And yes, the, definitely the 70s were the result of a cultural revolution, revolution that started in the, in the 60s. Uh, I think America was open to new influence, such also as new spirituality, new cultures for all, all around the world, and uh, also new lifestyles. So I guess this rising of uh, interest for ethnic fabric is a response to this uh, social cultural environment. And um, I come from a multicultural family and I, this uh, always drove me to open myself to other culture. And uh, I was very happy to go through what, what the, the 70s was uh, offering in terms of ethnic fabrics. Fantastic. And next question goes to Evelyn. Evelyn, you've shared with me that the garments that we saw in the museum surprised you because they were very different from the flashy, fun 70s styles that you first had in your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But yet you also shared that you were able to take the two kind of conflicting 70s fashion themes, the buttoned up conservative look and then the fun, bright and bold colors. And you definitely created a harmonious design. How did you manage to mesh those two themes together? Well, like you said, Jordan, um, to me, like the dresses didn't really seem like um, the stereotypical like 70s um, garments that we see such as um, such as like crop tops and bell bottoms and um, just like, sorry, I lost the meeting. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so to me, I wanted to incorporate the, the very like, we had to make the dresses very um, inspired by these garments and none of it was stereotypical 70s. So what I did was um, I decided to uh, share my uh, color palette and expand it instead of using navy blues and very dull colors like brown. I wanted to make it more uh, mustard colors and um, definitely make it seem like a more psychedelic dress that um, a rich conservative lady would wear. and um yeah definitely incorporate the colors into um those very fancy like wealthy dresses very nice well you did a great job with it thank you uh, i'd like to go back to maureen for a second maureen um i know that you were also inspired by the crafts movement as you said in the 70s um what was it in particular that struck you about that crafts movement and how did you translate that into your final garment um I think like in the 70s, as you mentioned, like there was this craft movement and it was very important to make something with your heart. And uh, I really wanted to have this dress that could be in pass on, on generation, this idea like, you know, exactly like a quilt because this is really, for me, a part of the American culture. And it's something that I was very happy to, to learn. And uh, so I tried to reproduce that in my garment and to make it in the inside as beautiful as the outside and pay attention to the same finishing and make some like a special Hong Kong finish with like a, a matching fabrics and things like that. Just I feel like it's precious and so something like uh, you, you, make, you spend so much time on it so it, it becomes something uh, that's precious. That's lovely. Um, a follow-up to that is you know, one of the things that's striking about your dress is it tends to combine several fabrics that most people wouldn't necessarily put together, um, but yet in their garment, in your garment, they work so well. So how did you choose the fabrics that you did and, and what inspired you to um, choose them, to select them? Uh, to be honest, uh, it took me weeks uh, of uh, gathering fabric website. And then I came, uh, uh, it, something came upon me and it was this Indian uh, cotton ball and I found it amazing. I think it was so fluid and flowy, but also like natural, like cotton, some, a simple fabric, not something crazy. And uh, so I dig into Indian uh, cotton ball and so I started making a selection of different fabrics in my mind and I, I decided at the last moment what I would do with it. It just talked to me at the last moment. But uh, there is some tricks. I mean, it's not like uh, it's magic. I, I learned in quilting actually that you need to mix uh, like different kind of skills and geometric with, you know, with maybe more round shapes and that works well. So it's also tricks I learned in the That's past. Wonderful. Well, your knowledge clearly paid off. <laughs> you did a great job. Uh, I'd like to move on to Arancia. So something really unique about your garments that I don't think everyone is aware of, um, in particular because you can't see them in person, is that they're extremely functional in that they contain adaptive closures. Um, I know this is something that is very near and dear to your heart. Can you talk about what makes your clothes adaptive and what led you to include these in your design? Of course, so for these specific, specific garments, the pants actually have waist elastic. So it's, it's easier for individuals to pull up the pants, whether they or a caregiver is helping them pull it up. And also the, the top or the jacket is actually Velcro closures. So again, it's easier to put it on and take it off. And that really does 
um, improve quality of life in a way because it gives you some independence and something as easy as being able to choose a style of clothing that you like and being able to put it on yourself is something that is very important for me and to be able to give that out to all communities, communities regardless of their physical or mental abilities. So next, I'd like to move to Geneva. Something that, uh, another thing that the audience can't see because we're not up close is um, your design includes quite a lot of pattern pieces, mm -hmm. are numerous ones. Can you tell us how many individual pieces you ended up with to make your garment and, and how you went about creating all those pieces? So I ended up with 94 pattern pieces because some of the, sections in the garment have a double layer. Um, so the sheer fabric can't be sheer everywhere. So I had to put something on the back, which that's called flat lining. So you put another pattern piece on the back to make it opaque. So that's how I ended up with 94 pattern pieces. And it was so fun to sew. <laughs> I sense a little bit of sarcasm there. <laughs> I just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a trooper because it came out beautifully. <laughs> um, Evelyn, moving to you. So as you've stated, your color palette definitely embodies the bold, fun colors from the early 70s fashion. But I also know that you modified some of your fabric before you put it into your dress. Can you tell us about some of the custom textile techniques that you did um, when you created your garment? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the lace on both the godet and the sleeves was in inspired by the Tijuana dress because it was the only dress that had lace. And I really wanted to include all different types of textures into my garment. For example, like the purple top part is suede. The pockets that I included is corduroy and the sleeves are lace. And it was originally like a very pale yellow. And I didn't think the pastel really meshed with my whole design. So I wanted to make it pop. And of course I dyed it um, with just regular uh, Ritz dye. Um, and I included the 70s um, tie dye was very popular in the 70s. So I tied it up and um, hoped for the best. And it turned out like a really nice color and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. You should be, I think that was a very smart choice. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go back to Aransa because this ties into you as well. Your garment also utilizes custom fabric treatments. So can you tell us about what textile treatments you used and how you went about creating them? Sure, of course. So for the pants and the lapel, I did paint some very uh, loud and big uh, plaid. I had this idea of an American plaid that's um, bold and a little bit messy, but fun. So I decided to make that myself and see how it would work. And I'm really happy with um, the way I was able to control that, control the colors, control the size, even made it a little bit extra messy on purpose, of course. Um, and I'm really happy the way it turned out. It's, it's a, a happy uh, mess, you could say. That's very well put, yes, that's great. And a follow-up to that, uh, did you paint those panels before or after you constructed the garment? Oh, definitely before. Uh, I wanted to be a mess, but not that messy. No, before. <laughs> Good. Very nice. So uh, going back to Maureen, your silhouette in particular drew on the long flowy prairie dresses that I know were very popular in the 70s. Can you tell us how you adapted this trend to a design suitable for the modern woman? Yeah, first of all, uh, I love the little house in the prairie and uh, every French people probably like uh, watch it five times and <laughs> and uh, more seriously, uh, I was inspired by the woman who was wearing it and um, who was she, uh, what what was her personality, her lifestyle and um, I was, I imagined her as a blooming flower, a bold, powerful, romantic, uh, flirty, but not too sweet. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's, she, this style can be considered like boho chic, which is sort of timeless. And uh, actually today it's, uh, it's quite a trend, like all this flowy, uh, ruffled dress, um, it, it's coming back. <laughs> 
It is, yes. Yeah. Maybe you started it. <laughs> I didn't, but uh, while I was doing the dress, I realized I was definitely not the only one drawing this kind of stuff. <laughs> That's okay. That's what fashion is, right? Just yeah. pulling from a bunch of different influences. Mm -hmm. Um, so something unique about your dress that I'm sure I'd love to share with the audience here is that uh, your dress went through some design changes along the way. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, <laughs> when I turned it in, it was uh, 12 inches shorter. Yeah. So um, I'd like to talk about what led you to change this in your design and what that process was like for you. Um, well, I'm going to be very honest. I designed this dress and uh, for my size and I put it on the dress form and I realized it missed something. It was, uh, first of all, it was short. I put no models gonna be able to wear that dress. And then I thought like it missed something more dramatic. Uh, this last ruffle really adds to the drama of dress. It adds a flare and uh, it adds also length, like her legs look like uh, gigantic. And uh, I'm very happy I did it. This ruffle was a lot of work. Like, uh, as I said, like three yards, like 22 feet of ruffle. Yeah. And um, a lot of gathers. <laughs> But uh, I'm, I'm very happy I made this uh, decision. I think it was a really smart move. So good for you for yeah, not being you. satisfied and just pushing yeah. it through. <laughs> um, and then the final question I have is for Geneva. So your garment has a lot of detail that is only really visible close up, but I definitely want our panel to appreciate all the work that went into it. So can you talk about the handwork that you did and the, how you combined a few different textiles and um, your hand-sewn embellishments? Yes, so like I was um, mentioning before, I um, combined lace and chiffon to create this fun look. But um, on this photo, you actually can't see the sleeve, but the sleeve has a ruffle that spirals around it. And this ruffle has beading on the edge. And <clears throat> this, this was all hand-sewn. So it's just that I like adding details that are not obvious and that you can only see up close. And I think that even some, some things that I add that nobody knows about, only the person wearing it, like a little button on the back and it's on the inside. So nobody can see it except the person wearing it. And I, it's, to me, it's just something really fun. So on this photo, you can sort of see the, the tiny bugle beads on the ruffle on the sleeve. So yes, I just love adding little details and I like anything that sparkles. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, even though we can't see it because it's not, it's so up close, I know that that model, when she put it on, she was just elated to put it on and she felt so special and she definitely did notice all those little details. So good job. <laughs> Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Sheila, and we're going to see if we have questions from our viewers. Looks like we have a couple questions. Um, well, first question is, where is the pull button? The pull button, um, it, I think it depends on what kind of computer or what you're looking at here, but it should just say polling or pull, and you can just click on that. Um, this question's for Aranza. Was it difficult working with the Velcro? Uh, no, I've had some trial and error before it, so I, I know a little bit about Velcro. Um, don't use heat on it, it'll melt. <laughs> um, but no, not too bad. I would definitely recommend exploring. There's a lot of different types of Velcro. There's small, tiny circle Velcro. There's strips Velcro. So just explore it if you want to use Velcro, and don't be afraid of it. It's not too bad. Great, thank you. Um, and there, this one's coming from Becca Arnold. Beck is asking, what influences, if any, can still be seen today from the designs of the 1970s? Who wants to answer? How about um, Geneva? I think that the 70s are still very relevant in a lot of sense because, I mean, every little flowy peasant style tops or dresses. I love maxi dresses and also the billow sleeves that are very in right now that's that originated in the 70s. So I think that it's very relevant and of course it comes back in a different way 
more modern it has a twist to it when it comes back but i think it's very relevant still great thank you Geneva. um next question is let's see did anyone care for 70s clothing before this project or did this add did did this add to the challenge of the project Um, I've always been really into like 70s influence in general. Um, I just absolutely love the color palette of the 70s. So when I found out that this was our decade, I was like, yes, I love it. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, I would say that beforehand, I, I've always been into the 70s for sure. It was anyone like else? perfect fit. Anyone else have anything to add? How about Maureen? I was not really into 70s fashion, but uh, I was very happily surprised of, by everything I, I discovered. It's actually not just this polyester, uh, white pants uh, and weird shirts with crazy colors. Uh, it's much more than this. And especially the, 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 the garment you pulled from the, the museum, from the archives, were totally unexpected for me. Great. I was born in the 70s, but I was a baby. I was born in 79, so <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have a chance to dress like that. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, we have a question from Destiny. Destiny wants to know, is the 70s style something you could picture bringing into your future designs? They are all amazing. How about Evelyn? Um, yes, I would definitely uh, still keep doing like 70s influenced uh, fashion. Um, I'm very excited to like endure future projects and see how far I could take it. And yeah, I'm very excited to incorporate the 70s, keep incorporating the 70s into my garments. Uh, I think it's Lise wants to know how long did it take for the designers to complete their designs from inception? Inception to completion. I'll take that one. Um, so, uh, hi, Lisa. She's one of our faculty members. <laughs> uh, so, the designers actually had about nine weeks from the time they first saw the garments to the time their final garment was due and it was being judged. And um, that may sound like a brief period of time, but also keep in mind, all these designers were also just learning how to drape at the same time. So like before they even saw the designs, they had just learned how to drape a basic bodice. I don't even think we'd gotten to the skirt yet. <laughs> so they had quite a challenge for them. They were designing kind of um, hoping that they would understand enough by the time they were ready to get into the mock-up phase to drape their designs. But they all obviously did. They did a wonderful job. It's just, it's a very quick turnaround. They all work very, very hard. Great, thank you. So we have time for a few more questions. Um, this one is, uh, can the panelists give an estimate of the hours they put in on their garments? Anyone wanna jump in at onset? Can you uh, repeat the question one more time, sorry. Can, can you estimate how many hours were put into your garment? True, for me, I think it was probably, I don't know, maybe, 20, 30 hours total, but again, we were, I was in collaboration with a draping class, so we were being graded by Jordan, so we had to do muslin samples, um, paper patterns, so it was a whole process, uh, but I think about 20, 30 hours uh, for my project specifically. All right, um, next question is, this is for all the designers, did any family and or friends influence your clothes for a more personal touch, any of your designs? Um, well, my mom was born and raised in Tijuana. So um, I was very excited to be influenced by the Tijuana dress because I know that um, she was born and raised there and she grew up in the 70s. So she tells me all her stories. I see all her pictures with her hair and her outfits. And I think a lot of that, um, like I said, my biggest inspiration was like my mom for sure. Um, so yeah, she was like, she tell she influenced me a lot in a lot of ways. Like as I was designing my dress, I was gonna go for a midi skirt, 
but she told me like go for the maxi because maxi skirts were in and or maxi skirt and she told me if you're gonna go long go long that was in so i trusted her um intuition and yeah so my mom was like a huge inspiration for me great thank you evelyn um here's a question from uh, Ava, do any of you plan to try out for Project One Runway? I love your true passion for fashion. You are all talented. Anybody want to answer? I, I actually would like to be on Project Runway or like any reality show for designers because I just think it, I would like that challenge and that experience. And obviously on, when you watch it on TV, it looks so easy. It doesn't seem like as challenging, but I think that it's definitely a huge challenge. And I just would like to have that experience. Great, thank you, Geneva. Um, this one's from Patty. For all the designers, do you find your material first, then draw your sketch or the other way around? Let's go to um, uh, Maureen. So I'm sorry, can I? Can you repeat just the beginning of the question? Did you find your material first, then draw your sketch, or the other way around? No, I think I drew my sketch uh, at the museum when I was looking at the other dress. Um, it just came out like that. Uh, it, it, I, I barely changed it after. Great. Um, and this one's coming from Chuck. Hi, Chuck. Did anyone listen to 70s music or other types from that time? Oh, I definitely did. I yeah. inspired my parents with um, Dancing Queen. Mm. From <laughs> definitely, that music is a huge inspiration for my clothes too. And I will say I played it in the classroom while they were draping too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely a lot of Fleetwood Mac was played as we yep. were like, <laughs> yeah, I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I love this song. <laughs> My favorite song. <laughs> favorite song. <laughs> Great. Um, another question is, how will this project influence your future designs? Let's go to um, anyone who wants to answer. Evelyn? Um, I think, um, well, since it was part of the whole draping class, I am so excited to drape all my projects up. Jordan was like an amazing professor. She was very patient with all of us. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think like most fashion designers would agree that like once you learn either pattern making or draping, like you, you choose one or the other. And I think I'm definitely uh, going to start draping a lot more after this. Um, I'm very excited to do that. I'm so happy I learned how to do that. It was great. Great. I agree. <laughs> okay, we have time for two more questions. Um, Let's see here. Um, if you could choose any decade to create a collection, what would it be? Let's just quickly go around, starting with Maureen. That's a hard question. Um, um, 80s. 80s, all right. Yeah. How about you, Geneva? What <laughs> would you create a collection for? I actually love the 70s, so I was so happy that it was the 70s, but before um, the 70s, I think the other option would be the 1900s because I love the Edwardian style and just the structure of the garments. I, I, it, Jordan got me into that one because before I took another class with her, I just didn't, I wasn't so knowledgeable about it, but I really appreciate it now. Great, thank you. Evelyn, how about you? I would probably do the 90s. <laughs> it's not too far back, but um, it's really cool and it's kind of coming back. Maybe like 90s or early 2000s would be cool to um, experiment with those decades for sure. Fun, and how about you, Aransa? Um, Maybe a little bit sneaky, but I would try to go futuristic and not like in a futuristic metal kind of way but more of a sustainable, how can we make classic looks that don't have to be rebought, something that would last a long time. I think that's what I would go with. 
Thank you. That's fun. And this very last question we have today, and I'm sorry for those of you, we have so many questions coming in right now. I wish we could get to them all. Um, but we unfortunately don't have time today. Um, but what we will do is once the History Center is back open, um, we will be able, there will be viewing time um, to come in and see the garments in person. You can see all the um, inspiration pieces in person. And perhaps we may even have um, the designers come in and um, we can do, you know, we can maybe do something in the future. So um, stay tuned on the History Center website for more details um, about the Fashion Redux exhibit in person. Um, and the last question will once uh, again, we'll just go around um, is coming from Jill Hall. What dreams do each of you have for your future? I think Sheila froze there, so I'll just take over. Um, so uh, Evelyn, let's start with you. What dreams do you have for your future and where do you want to go from here? Your designs. Um, I definitely, I definitely uh, think a lot about my community and how much importance we need to take um, if we want to make it big to start with our community. So one of my biggest dreams would be to start um, a local fashion house. Um, the same way like the big companies do it, like Chanel and Balenciaga, Gucci, they all have their big fancy um, uh, fashion houses where like celebrities could go in and take and try on uh, custom garments. I want to take that concept and take it very local and design for musicians and artists and all kinds of um, creative folks here in San Diego and take it from there to across the world for sure. Great, and Maureen, do you wanna take this one too? Sure, um, I actually would love to be a textile buyer, fabric buyer, because uh, it's something that I used to do, I mean, not in fashion or fabric in my past life. Uh, I was, I own an organic grocery and I used to love going to international fair and uh, select small little gems of products. So I would love to do that in, uh, in with fabric. And Arancia, how about you? Uh, here we go. Uh, I would definitely want to continue making clothes for individuals, regardless of their physical or mental abilities. I really want to um, normalize that community and uh, make a company, a brand that includes everyone and hopefully that makes um, everyone more empathetic with everyone, not just that community, but just everyone can be more um, kind to one another. So hopefully uh, change society with clothes. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. But that, that would be a, a very big goal of mine. Fantastic. And Geneva, what about you? I would like to continue making garments for private clients. And eventually I want to uh, have a collection in the line that is size inclusive because it's very important to me to be size inclusive in my designs. So I really want to uh, make something that is fashionable and on trend and have it available for plus size women. Fantastic, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Sheila, do you wanna take, take it from here? Yes. Um, Let's see, so we are getting to that time where we're going to be presenting the awards. And before we do that, I want to um, just let everyone know that we had um, in this uh, competition or in this class, there were 24 people that entered um, their designs. Uh, I'm sure they were all very good um, based on the top four designers, how amazing your guys' designs are. So I really want to congratulate not just these four, but all 24 of the students that um, presented designs for this, and especially congratulate the four top designers um, on your accomplishments, because all the comments that are coming in, um, it, they're just, everybody thinks your designs are amazing. So I'm, I'm sure they cannot wait to come into the museum and see them in person. Um, and we had about almost 30 questions that we didn't get to. So I feel like there's another program coming on here. Mm -hmm. um, in the making. So um, without any further ado, um, this year 
for all four of the designers, um, the top designers, everybody will be receiving a $100 gift card to Sewing Machines Plus. And you will also be receiving a family membership uh, for one year to the San Diego History Center. So we just want to say thank you uh, for your partnership and thank you for your hard work. And um, we can't see where else this goes. So congratulations. Um, Jordan, would you like to go ahead and announce the four categories? I would love to. So congratulations to all of you. You did an amazing job. I could not be more proud of you. I'm just, my heart is bursting. Um, so the four categories that we had were we had uh, best translation of historic garment. And this one went to Maureen. So Maureen, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you very much for teaching us very, so nicely. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, the next category that we had was most innovative garment. And this one went to Arancia. <laughs> Yay. And Arancia. the next category we had was most creative fabrication. And this one went to Evelyn. So Evelyn, Yay! good job. <laughs> Come on. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course, of course. And last but certainly not least, uh, the last category we had was most impressive construction. And this went to Geneva. Hey, thank you. 800,000 pattern pieces. <laughs> So congratulations, you guys. You all did a fantastic job. And thank you again to the San Diego History Center. I look forward to more collaborations with you guys. And who knows, maybe we'll keep doing a digital thing in addition, because this was a lot of fun. <laughs> I definitely think we've, we've found um, and built in an extra layer here. Um, so looking at the polling results, I want to announce the winner of the um, viewer's choice. And this was so close, off by just a few votes. Um, but this year's winner in the, uh, for the viewer's choice goes to Geneva Barboa. Thank you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Are you surprised? I thought Maureen was going to win. No. <laughs> you guys all deserve it. You, you did fantastic. Congratulations. Congratulations. You deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sheila, for everything. And I really appreciate that we were all able to come together to do this. Fantastic. You're very welcome. Um, so at this time, it's the, it's we're concluding our program. Um, but again, I want to thank everyone who attended um, the event. I apologize again for not getting to all your questions. They keep coming in, by the way. Um, we'll figure something out there. And um, I want to thank all of our members. Thank you for your membership. Thank you for your support. Our donors, thank you so much for supporting the History Center. Um, especially at a time like this, when everything is so uncertain um, and the support is needed so much right now. Um, and everyone, our donors and our members are really pulling through for us um, to help us continue sustaining our mission of the San Diego History Center to um, preserve, promote, and reveal the history of San Diego and our region. So um, I wanna thank the panelists. I wanna thank the, um, Mesa College students and faculty and all your friends and family that have joined us tonight. Um, and anyone else that I forgot, I apologize. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. And we can't wait to see you at the San Diego History Center when we reopen, when everybody is safe and sound. So for now, good night, everybody. And Sheila, uh, real quick, is this recording going to be available for people? If yes, anybody thank you. Started? We are, uh, the recording will be, um, we will be uploading it to YouTube. We'll also be posting it on our um, website eventually, but we'll send all that information out. Um, it probably won't be available for a few days um, at least, but we will send that message out when it's available to view. So thank you for asking that, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you everybody. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good job, guys. Bye. Bye. Good job, everyone. Good job.